Hello guys, we are back, Six Science Facts with Miss Jamie. Had a super fun time last week and I'm super excited to learn more facts with you again this week. So I'm just going to dive right in. Um, our first fact this week is about mammals. And this week we're learning about hippopotamuses. Hippopotamus. <laughs> I like that illustration. That looks like my face when I'm eating snacks. Hippopotamuses are found in many areas of sub-Saharan Africa, where they spend much of their time in rivers, lakes, and swamps to stay cool in the water and mud. Hippopotamus is from the Greek, meaning river horse. The closest living relatives of the hippopotami are whales and porpoises. Oh wow, I didn't know that. That's really cool. Although predominantly herbivores, they eat leaves and graze on grass. Hippos can outrun humans, are very aggressive, and are considered to be one of the most dangerous animals in Africa. Wow. That is so cool. I had no idea that whales and porpoises were related to hippopotamuses. They're more related to hippopotamuses than hippopotami. I'm sorry, that is the cor that's the correct plural of hippopotamus, is hippopotami. Um, I had no idea that the closest living relatives of hippopotami are whales and porpoises. That is so cool. Um, also, they're technically herbivores most of the time, but they're also considered to be one of the most dangerous animals in Africa because they're so aggressive. I don't know. Fact number two. All right. Fact number two is about fossils and minerals, and today we're going to learn what mineral minerals actually are. Look at that. It's a nice illustration. A mineral is an inorganic, natural chemical substance composed of one or more elements, usually solid crystals. There are about 2,000 known minerals. Among the most common are quartz, feldspar, and mica. These make up many rocks. Silver, gold, and diamonds are also minerals. Very small amounts of some mineral minerals are essential for a healthy diet. Okay. That's pretty simple then. Minerals are just elements that have combined together. Minerals are made up of one or more elements, so they're just compounds of elements. And it says here that also um, you need minerals in your diet to keep you healthy. The third fact of the day is about flowers and bugs. Today we're learning about, so cool, the Venus flytrap, which is a carnivorous plant. They eat meat. The Venus flytrap. This, car <clears throat> this carnivorous plant uses nectar on its leaves to lure insects to land and feed. <clears throat> When disturbed by a visitor, tiny hairs on the leaf trigger the jaws of the fly trap to close, trapping the insect inside where the plant consumes and absorbs its nutrients. Wow. Okay, so basically the plant just baits the flies or whatever other kind of bugs with a nectar that it seeps out on its leaves, and then when the unsuspecting victim lands, the leaves close. Number four. This is a question that um, I've been asked lots of times, and I've also wondered this question a lot. Why the sky is blue? Light travels in waves. Our atmosphere is full of gas molecules smaller than the waves themselves. Longer wavelengths of light, yellow, orange, and red, pass through our atmosphere, but the shorter visible wave wavelengths, blue, are more frequently absorbed by tiny gas molecules and scattered in every direction. These wavelengths appear blue and also give the sky its color. Okay, so because oops, you couldn't see my face there, I didn't even realize I was too absorbed trying to understand this. <laughs> but I think I get it. So um, 
other colors of light like red, orange, and yellow have long wavelengths. So their wavelengths are very long and they pass through the atmosphere. They don't get trapped. But the short wavelengths, short, 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 are more frequently absorbed by tiny gas molecules. Um, and then scattered in every direction. They kind of lost me at scattered in every direction. I get that there are short wavelengths versus long wavelengths that, and that the short wavelengths get trapped, but that's about it. But now we know that the reason the sky is blue is because of the wavelength of the, the color blue in light form. That one's really kind of uh, conceptually tough, but I hope you I hope you hung on with me there. Fact five is about birds and leaves today, and we are going to be learning about the flamingo. <laughs> I love that illustration; it's so cute. The flamingo is a flamboyant bird with bright pink feathers and long, spindly legs. Its rich color depends on its diet. The algae and crustaceans that it eats are rich in car carotenoids, the pigments responsible for its vivid color. The more carotenoids in the flamingo's diet, the more deeply colored its feathers are. Carotenoids are also found in carrots and watermelons. Okay, that's really interesting. So, the flamingo is only that color because of the food that it eats. And this can happen to people, too. I don't know if you guys will believe me, but this is true. When I was a really little girl, I really liked carrots. And they mention carrots in here. But I also really liked um, sweet potatoes, which also have carotenoids in it, I suppose. Because I ate so much sweet potatoes and I ate so many carrots that my skin actually turned orange. So, like, right now you can see it's sort of like a, like a very light pink, almost, or... Or very light tan but um, my mom says that when I was little it was orange because of how much carrots and sweet potatoes I ate so it can happen to people too last fact last fact of the day all right the last fact of the day is about under the water and today we are learning about x-ray fish which I think is like super interesting what does that even mean x-ray fish Oh, it's a, it's a type of fish. Okay. These small freshwater fish, not even in the ocean, these are freshwater fish. Um, their Latin name is Pristella nexillaris, native to coastal rivers of South America, are about two to three inches long and are so transparent that their internal organs and bones are visible. They are called x-ray fish because you can see right through them. Wow, so they can't perform x-ray or they don't have any electrical, nothing like that. They're just totally transparent so you can see through them. That's so weird. Yeah, you can kind of see like in the illustration, you can see through the fish. You can see the algae in the background. Ha, that's so weird. Good camouflage though, right? And for the last part of six science facts, as always, we're going to follow up this video with some more information about a fact from last video. Um, this information is, of course, provided by a book that you can check out at the Blue Island Public Library if you want. Um, this week, we are learning more about dun -dun -dun, living fossils, which if you remember, that's what a ginkgo tree is, slash like a ginkgo leaf, I think is what we officially learned about. So this is a pretty long book. I can't tell if you can tell, but it's about 60 pages. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you right now. I'm just going to read a couple chapters that explain a little more about what a living fossil is and um, a little bit more about the ginkgo tree because I think it talks about it in here explicitly. All right. An introduction. Hmm. How can a fossil be living? 
How? How? You don't need to look far to find a living fossil. A ginkgo tree with its fan-shaped leaves may be growing in a nearby park or garden. A dragonfly might buzz through an open window. Or a silverfish? Ew. A cockroach? Ew. Or even a scorpion? May scurry through a room in your house. Not in my house. An opossum may inhabit your backyard. Or they're usually called possums. All of these are living fossils. They are living links with our remote past. Fossils are the parts or remains of a plant or an animal that have been turned to stone or left, with, or left an imprint or hollow in the stone. On rare occasions, fossil remains have been preserved in hardened resin or amber or some other medium such as peat. Certain fossils are called trace fossils. So trace fossils are fossils that have been preserved in something besides rock, like amber, a mineral. Chapter 1. The Tree of Life. The 19th century British naturalist Charles Darwin coined the phrase living fossil. He wrote of them, they have endured to the present day from having inhabited a confined area and from having been exposed to less varied and therefore less severe competition. Darwin thought of living fossils as organisms that evolved at very slow rates. Many millions of years and thousands of generations are needed for new life forms to develop. Darwin used the term living fossil in talking about one species, the Chinese tree ginkgo biloba. Certainly there are some extremely rare and exotic plants and animals that seem to fit Darwin's definition, but some living fossils are not rare at all. Darwin was 22 when he was invited to sail as the official naturalist on the voyage of the Beagle. This was a scientific expedition sponsored by the British, by the British government. This is a picture of a ginkgo tree. It says, the ginkgo tree is a living remnant of the age of the dinosaurs. Wow. So ginkgo trees were around when dinosaurs were around. So the same exact tree, the same exact tree, exactly how it is now, was around when dinosaurs were around. In the course of the five-year-long journey, he compiled information on animal diversity around the world. This he used as evidence for his theory on evolution based on the process of natural selection. After he returned to England, Darwin continued his research and writings and mulled over his theories. He was 50 years old in 1859 when his book on the origin of species was published. Darwin believed that evolution creates new species through the process of natural selection. Certain fossils, called trace fossils, are evidence of ancient life forms such as tracks or footprints that are hardened into stone. By definition, fossils are the remains of dead things. How then can we talk about living fossils? Living fossils are examples of currently living organisms that developed in very ancient times and have remained relatively unchanged. Living fossils have usually survived longer than the other forms of life they developed with. The process of evolution has changed the basic form and behavior of almost all plants and animals. But the species of plants and animals that we call living fossils have remained largely untouched by evolutionary changes. Some living fossils are common, well-known species. Cockroaches and possums fit into this category. They have a broad adaptability that has allowed them to survive. They are cases of arrested evolution types of organisms that have simply stopped changing. Other living fossils are somewhat rare survivors, such as the ginkgo tree or the horseshoe crab. And some living fossils are older than other living fossils. 
They have some pictures here of some living fossils. So here you can see the cockroaches. Gross. Here you can see the, sp the scorpion. Also gross. And here is the possum, which I also think is really gross. But ginkgo trees aren't gross. The earth was formed about 4.5 billion years ago. According to scientists' estimates, life originated in the seas around 3 billion years ago. Few fossils are found in rocks older than 600 million years. Some living things existed before then, but these earliest life forms were mostly simple, one-celled organisms. They were small and had mostly body parts that did not readily become fossilized. Still, scientists believe these simplest life forms have not changed much since they first appeared. Paleontologists are scientists who study fossils to try and piece together the story of life on Earth. They study plant and animal fossils, just as botanists and zoologists study living plants and animals. The fossil record has many gaps. A lot of scientific guesswork goes into reconstructing Earth's natural history. There are organisms living today that have remained unchanged for half a billion years or more. Other living fossils date back only a hundred million years or so. This right here, this picture is of the horseshoe crab. The caption says, the horseshoe crab found along the eastern coast of the United States is a relative of the ancient trilobites. So that living fossil can be found in the United States. This is the last part of the book that I'm going to be reading from. Living fossils, today and tomorrow. Many of our living fossils were found years after scientists became convinced that these life forms were already extinct. Persistent tales of creatures such as the Loch Ness Monster, the American Bigfoot or Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest, or the abominable, abominable snowman of the Himalayas could contain some kernel of truth. Perhaps some unknown survivors or missing links of vanished species still exist in these places. Some scientists think it's possible, though unlikely, that a few medium-sized dinosaurs could still exist in remote portions of Africa or South America. There are occasional reports of sightings of such a beast or of a flying reptile, but no one has yet produced any hard evidence. Most likely, the observers did not know what they were looking at. Stories of monsters do underscore one quality that many living fossils seem to have. The ability to keep themselves hidden, thus avoiding threats from humans and other predators. Although such speculation is still in the realm of science fiction, scientists may one day be actually... Scientists may one day be actually able to reconstruct plants and animals of the past. They would do this through genetic engineering and DNA reconstruction. DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, provides the blueprint for all life forms. It is the arrangement of the components of DNA that determines how genes are able to create and transmit the characteristics that make up an organism. In the tree of life, some life forms die off. Others continue, making few or no changes. Others flourish. 
or they may change and evolve into new successful types. There are no clear-cut reasons why certain plants and animals have become living fossils. One of the reasons may be adaptability. Another may be luck. In order to survive, a plant or animal species must gradually adapt to changing conditions. These adaptations allow the organisms to capture food, move from place to place, protect themselves, and rear their young more successfully than their competitors. The mechanisms that, lead, that led to certain species becoming living fossils in the past are still at work today. Some species are dying off and others are surviving, perhaps only by the skin of their teeth, and perhaps not for long. Today's living species of plants and animals could become tomorrow's living fossils. This was a pretty long book and I skipped through a lot of it, but I hope that this clarified what living fossils are for you a little bit because I know it did for me. Um, a living fossil is an organism that is still alive today that existed, you know, millions of years ago basically in the same exact form that it is today it hasn't changed at all whereas a lot of creatures have evolved over time and don't exist anymore or exist in a different form creatures like cockroaches or the ginkgo tree exist in the same exact way that they always have for millions of years and they haven't changed at all that's so interesting I'm so glad we learned about this fact today, learned more about this fact today. So thanks for joining me for Six Science Facts. I hope you had as much fun learning today as I did. And tune in, tune in again soon um, to learn some more. Don't forget to comment if you want to learn about one fact, one, one fact from this week more than the others. All right. Comment, comment, comment.